I get irritated with the making of obsessed media world in which we increasingly live, and rightly or wrongly believe in preserving the mystery of creation. Can't art just speak for itself? So I imposed a strict photography ban on the crew during the three-month shoot, as I didn't want photos being distributed of what we were doing. Many months later, the day finally came when I started showing the finished panoramas to people. And completely predictably, some people asked if I just added in the panels in Photoshop. Cue my silent scream. Months of work spent on production of prints of life-size animals. Giant panels constructed of elaborate aluminium frames. Up to 23 men at a time carrying 10 meter long or high panels in 40 degree plus heat. And heaving them up and strapping them down and leveling them and... And in theory, I could have just stayed at home and done it all in Photoshop. Fortunately, my assistant from the US disobeyed my edict and had surreptitiously shot some photos on his iPhone. I also took a few on mine. Between the two, you are thus able to see the photos in this film, showing that the panels were indeed there on location. But then you may ask, well, so what? What difference does it make that the panels were actually there? Couldn't I have achieved the same result by compositing the animal portraits into the panoramas in Photoshop? Actually, it makes a huge difference. Shooting reality with the physical life-size panels present was always going to produce far superior results due to the countless unexpected incidents, both small and large, that occur through any shoot. A photo like Underpass with Elephants reveals so much more as a result of the panel being there. I never imagined that the elephants would look so trapped between the two gargantuan concrete pillars, the matriarch appearing to be looking almost sympathetically at the humans also rendered homeless. I never imagined that her trunk would appear to be practically resting on the ground in front of the panel, not confined to the panel itself. I wanted just one person, a child, to see the animals in the panel, while all around, no one else did. But I never imagined that this tiny boy, a child of one of the many homeless people sleeping out on the land beneath this underpass, would wander into frame, fascinated by these giant elephants, and touch them with what appears to be a stick in his hand. And I never imagined all the homeless kids, some as young as six or seven, sniffing glue from the bottles hanging from their faces. I never imagined the cruelly juxtaposed billboard beyond, featuring a well-to-do middle-class African man leaning back in his garden chair with a tagline beneath, Lean back, your life is on track. Whilst on the subject of locations and happenstance, we'd spent months looking for locations that would match those in the original animal portraits. In almost all instances, these species inhabited these locations but were subsequently driven out by man. The toughest locations to find and align were those portraits with hills in the background. I was actually on the verge of giving up altogether with a photo of the rhino mother and baby, wasteland with rhinos, when one afternoon, walking up an unexplored road at the dump site, I saw an angle on the hills beyond and with huge relief discovered the perfect match of contours. Every day the garbage trucks drive up to the dump site where we were photographing. As they dump their contents onto the toxic smoking pile of waste already there, scores of people who live on the periphery of the dump site appear from out of nowhere and descend on the trucks, scavenging alongside the pigs for scraps of rotting food that they eat right there. My crew and I photographed there for about 10 days, and within that time almost every crew member became sick with bacterial infections, lung infections, nosebleeds, some in as little as two days. So imagine what it's like for the people who spend their lives there, for whom there's little chance of escape. I hope that viewers of these photos realise it's not just the animals that are victims of this destruction of the natural world. It's also the impoverished humans that are victims as well. Over prior years of photographing portraits of animals in East Africa, each of those featured in the panels was originally unused, for whatever reason, justified or unjustified. 
Fortunately, this did mean that when I started poring over 10 years worth of contact sheets, I found quite a few that worked well within the context of this project. Take the photo of Comquat and her family, a photo that was taken just a week or two before this glorious matriarch and two of her daughters were brutally murdered at the hands of poachers. I approach the photographic portraiture of animals no differently to the portraiture of humans. But this becomes more complicated when it's a group portrait of animals, simply because, of course, I can't direct them in how or where to pose. The original photo of Comquat and her family had worked very well for me, except for one flaw. If you photograph a group portrait of humans and someone's head is concealed, you would reject that photo. For me, the same applies here, as the head of Kwanzaa, the small calf in shot, is concealed behind Kumquat, his mother. But here in the panorama setting, little Kwanzaa looks like he's cowering under his mother, hiding from the monumental trucks thundering by them. And so it is that the original weakness of the photograph becomes one of its strengths. There were other photos that became stronger when resuscitated for this project. In Quarry with Giraffe, I felt the original portrait of the giraffe looking over the plains was not quite powerful enough, because I'd photographed him from behind. But here in the setting of the giant quarry, he appears to be looking out at his former home and seeing what's now become of it, a former paradise laid waste and stripped bare. In Alleyway with Chimpanzee, the panel of the chimp is set by a semi-stagnant stream of fetid sewage. I'd rejected the original portrait because I'd hoped for more of a connection with the chimp. But here in the alleyway location, with his head bowed, he appears, in my mind, to be lamenting the loss of the world that he once knew, and the denuded world that is now there in its place. As with all my previous work, this series was shot on black and white medium format film. Each panorama was constructed out of 6x7 negatives, stitched together in Photoshop to create the final widescreen view. Practically speaking, to shoot this series on film instead of digital was even more crazily, willfully impractical than usual. I was stuck in East Africa on a three-month shoot, with no way of processing the film and printing contact sheets to the negatives within 3,000 miles. There was no way of knowing whether it really would all come together until months later when back home 9,000 miles away. So every two weeks, unable to deal with the growing stress over what I'd photographed, would actually even be there on the film, we would arrange for someone interested in a free flight to Britain to hand carry a couple of hundred exposed film rolls all the way to a small film lab in central London. However, just seeing scans of his contact sheets was not enough to guarantee whether when stitched, the panoramas would work. It was only those months later back home where, engaged in the time-consuming and frequently pointless task of scanning possible negatives in high resolution, I was finally able to discover if the focal planes of each frame aligned with the next so that nothing looked focally inconsistent when stitched together. So perhaps inevitably you ask, would you shoot film again on an equivalent project with all the stress and massive extra expense? Yes.